Well, greetings. Thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be answering a couple of questions that uh, some of you guys have written in to the Ask Savannah link. And uh, what else? I'm going to cover, cover a couple of other things that have happened since my last little video, my newsletter. <laughs> um, this one I'll, actually I'll put out to the, um, the general YouTube crowd because I will be um, answering some Ask Savannah style questions as well. But um, in Blackwich Coven this week, I just wanted to share with you a couple of things that happened that was really cool. Blonde Gypsy actually completed her, what was it, 5-5 five, five ritual. And that was a huge success, unbelievable success for her in that ritual. Um, it was quite a, a simple ritual, simple meaning that it was basically all about intention. It was getting it done and just allowing that to go off into the universe and manifest. Um, so many of you took part of that. So that's really, really awesome. And uh, she was just blown away by it as well. She said she had such a great feeling. Um, she had a lot of build up. We were talking before she did the ritual as well. She had such a great vibe and energy going into it. And when it completed or when she completed it, she said it just felt amazing. And so if you were involved in that ritual, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback as to um, how that's progressing. Uh, what else? What else? Oh, yes, yes. We culled our newsletter <laughs> audience by about four or 5,000 people. We have a tendency to do that, probably unlike other uh, places that collect or have subscribers. If you unsubscribe from us, we don't sort of keep you ready to market to you in the future. We actually just, we delete it. It's sort of like a respect thing. So we delete your email altogether. And, um, and if you're not interested in us anymore, like if you're not interested in reading what we have to say, and I totally get it, you know, you change your interests over time, then we go back in and uh, we delete people that haven't opened the newsletter. So if you're not receiving newsletters from us anymore, maybe you were part of that just mass culling that we just did <laughs> and you'll probably have to sign back up. So um, my apologies if you are part of that call. I know we've had so many emails this week just uh, just saying, hey, I want to be part of it, but I didn't open the newsletter. I'm really sorry. Let me just throw it out there and say I'm really sorry if you were part of that musk, mass culling. Um, just sign back up. It's super easy. And what else did I want to say? Oh, yes, the full moon. Oh, my gosh. How good was that? So, whew. Um, I kind of don't do something every single full moon, like a ritualistic wise, but I really felt inspired, especially with the last uh, full moon, because it was the last super moon, I think, for a long period of time. Um, and it was supposed to not be as big as some of the other super moons we've had um, in the past couple of occasions. So I decided to do a little ritual for it. And also, um, I do like to go through and cleanse my crystals as well. Traditionally, witchcraft, like in a witchcraft style, are uh, really good for charging and, and just uh, detoxifying them, if you like. So I had everything set up for that. And also, um, yeah, it was really a beautiful incorporating a lot of witchcraft in, into a midnight style ritual, of course. And the place I, I do this ritual, basically when the, the moon is like in the peak of the star, sky for me, um, it's like I can see it from where I'm sitting at, at the altar position to look straight out uh, at the window and essentially see the moon. And so I did, I did, I'm going to, I'm only mentioning this because I'm answering a question on this in a minute. So I did cast a circle this year uh not well this this time and the the circle i cast was basically oh gosh there's so many different names but like a demonic um circle or an elemental circle where basically i call to gatekeepers to each of the quarters um and to basically like north south east west if you're if you're new and to guard each of those quarters no, and by guard, I mean to hear me as well. So to invite you into my space 
to hear what I have to say and also asking you to protect me. And so, yeah, it is a protection, but it's almost like inviting them into my ritual on each of the quarters. So re remember, it's all about your mindset for what you're doing, any ritual. And when I was doing that full moon ritual, that's essentially what I was doing. I'm calling them to join me um, to the quarters. So I did a formal um, opening of the circle, if you want, and then I sat down. I had some actually Gothic Celtic music. <laughs> um, Alexa seemed to know what I was talking about. And I just, you know, lit the incense, set the pace, started with the, um, the crystal cleansing, starting with a spell that I was doing, basically um, a spell for my um, businesses uh, to release any of the old, to bring the abundance in um, and to reflect anything that is coming my way back on to the targets, um, which is, uh, has been super successful for myself and for some of the others that I have been doing that for as well. So um, if you're out there and you've got businesses or something you need to reflect back onto another, um, having that dual uh, style of spell on the full moon is super effective. And then the moon, watching that moon come up was unbelievable. Like the, the moon's gorgeous, right? And especially a full moon on a clear night. And I guess we haven't been that lucky. I'm in New Orleans. So I haven't been that, uh, um, it hasn't been that clear, I should say. But I was ready to go into another ritual. And then this moon, I thought I was tripping. I remember that I wasn't, you know, I wasn't drinking and I wasn't taking anything during this ritual. It was a clean ritual. The moon was phenomenal. The glow of the moon was one thing. And then basically I had to stop. I closed off the space, but then I spent some time in a meditative position just staring at the moon. And what it looked like was the moon had a complete rainbow all around it, full, complete auric rainbow, if you like. I could literally see each color. And I had to really just close out the ritual and just spend time staring at the moon. Now, I only had my iPhone to take a picture of the moon, but I was like, wow, I, am I tripping? This is just amazing. So if you're out there and you know what that actually means, please write in and tell us because the explanations they give for this online are uh, something to do with um, ice particles and certain parts of the world and so forth. I'm in Louisiana. It's humid here right now. So I don't know about the ice particles slash slash that type of theory, but um, it was just so beautiful, so intense. So I spent a good hour just reflecting, meditating and, and connecting with the moon, which I thought was really powerful. So we'll just see how that goes by the end of the month. I feel like uh, I felt really, really charged. And even now I feel, um, I always feel like fully charged, but I feel unbelievably charged. So watch out this month. Watch out me. <laughs> okay. So let's get into um, some questions for the Ask Savannah. Okay. The first one is from, I think it's Lona. My, my apologies if I've pronounced your name incorrectly. And uh, you've asked, I'm really curious about something. In the last month, I really took my practice to the next level and everything was great until after when I had a severe nosebleed. I have to mention that this kind of incident had never occurred to me, nor do I have pre-existing conditions or other health problems. And also... The next day this occurred as well. After about a week, the cycle had been repeated. Could this be related to my spiritual practice? Because due to immense energy shifts which were surrounding me, I can't tell if I'm doing something wrong or is it something else in the middle? Thank you for the effort and dedication shown. Okay, so severe nosebleeds. So there's a whole bunch of things that can go around 
um, intense spell casting or if you're changing up some of the rituals that you're doing it's not uncommon some of the other things that you may experience is dizziness um, sleepiness like you finish the ritual and you're just so fatigued that you almost feel like it's a uh, you've done something wrong because it's just zapped all your energy. Um, in some ca cases, of course, minor nosebleeds. Now that is actually all common. What it is, is basically you're using, well, obviously you're using your body to conduct energy. And when you switch over to some of the more powerful rituals, maybe you're introducing other beings, um, either invoking uh, where, where you're giving your energy away, it is so intense it can cause a physical response such as a nosebleed. Now, um, I wouldn't be worried that that is um, uh, something that is now possessing you or it was a negative effect due to something you shouldn't have done. It's just basically getting used to that volume of energy. It's like if you're new to exercise, you're on the treadmill and after the first session, you know, especially if you haven't done it for a while, you feel like your muscles are aching the next day. You feel like you have some sort of issue that you need to go and see the doctor for. It's, it's sort of just a normal part of getting back into this practice. Now, if you're finding that it's happening time and time again, what you'll probably need to do is introduce another energy conductor into your ritual until you become strong enough that your body doesn't phys um, physically respond in a negative way. So um, sometimes this was made for me, but it's a copper energy rod uh, with the stones in it. This is really good for grounding and also um, allowing the, the energy to flow through another object rather than yourself. And sometimes energy plates um, these are really good for multiple reasons, actually. Um, but these are also really good to help conduct the energy. Um, other people use um, crystals and so forth, depending on how good you are with actually using the crystals as well. But otherwise, remember to ground your energy after you finish the ritual. Um, I used to do that too. And when I was starting out, I really didn't know how important that was. I wouldn't ground the energy afterwards. And uh, it can feel somewhat simplistic sometimes, even doing things like having your palms and literally putting it on the ground and saying like tel uh, telepathically or just by action, pushing the energy from your body into the ground, like literally grounding it. And that has uh, helped me. Um, over the years sometimes depending on the ritual but you do have to release it and then after the ritual it's very important that you do something non-witchy completely non-witchy like just to ground that energy but um, let us know if you're still having this after trying um, some of those other suggestions or perhaps you guys out there have um, some different suggestions for our um, fellow practitioner the next question is by our Black Witch Coven uh, dear client, Joanne. And she is from Canada. I know that. <laughs> um, she says, here are my questions. Glass candles. Can we reuse the glass, clean it, put another candle in it, revive the initial intentions of that candle? So there are certain types of candles, especially in botanicas or in root work conjure um, hoodoo that they are glass encased candles they're quite gorgeous um, almost like tape a thicker taper candle and you can inscribe in it you can put rune sigils or um, witches alphabet you can write your name in there get really creative dress it with oils and herbs and glitter and sit it inside the jar looks absolutely stunning so if that's what you're referring to Joanne I guess we'll We'll talk about this a little bit more perhaps in our um, consultations. But uh, yes, it's okay. But I wouldn't, I'm a little bit funny about using an object like cross pollination of objects. So even when it comes to making my oils, I won't ever use the same tools to make the cursing oils even if they're washed and sanitized and so forth, but to then make a money oil, to then make 
a love oil and so forth. And it's the same with the jar candles. I don't, I don't cross pollinate. I don't, so you know what I mean. Um, and other uses for the jars, let me show you. <laughs> Now, yes, I do recycle, not all of them, because I do, gosh, I don't know, up to 100 candles a week, a lot of candles. So um, naturally, when I finish these for the clients, um, or even myself most of the time, 99.9% .9 of my jar candles will go to the trash. But um, some of them, for some types of herbs that I use frequently, I do, as you can see here, this is lemongrass. See how clear that jar is? Probably can't see with the background. But I've soaked that. I've scrubbed. I've scrubbed it. It was a it was a money herb uh, candle. And it, well, sorry, it was a money candle. And so that is um, yes reused. Uh, and then this plastic little top. It's not as good, of course, as a proper jar lid, but I'm using this all the time. So I'm not, I'm not hating if I just um, easily access this herb. I don't care. I'm going to go through a lot of this. If it was something that I'm not using a lot of, I'm going to use a, a proper jar or a proper tin to store the herb. So the next part of Joanne's question is on magic circles. Can we do without, she asks. I understand the circle is a way to contain the energy to make it more powerful. Uh, she says, I I know if, as I have read it, but I'm not feeling it when I do rituals. Can I do them without a circle? Is it possible or unacceptable to some deities? So magic circles, it depends on the ritual and the purpose. Like I explained at the beginning of this video, when I sometimes um, call to the quarters or create a magical circle, it's because perhaps I want a presence. I want a presence to be involved with my ritual. But you might be calling the elements, air, earth, water, fire, to each of the quarters in the appropriate position for your hemisphere. Um, and or you could there's lots of different things that you can call to the quarters of course in um, ceremonial magic rituals you're calling the archangels to the quarters um in more wicca or witchcraft you could be uh, calling the elements as i just said and the idea of calling those elements is to basically contain the energy and also create almost like that um that protection circle around you and to contain the energy in a space in a small vacuum so it's um, magically easier to manifest or control whatever you're trying to perform inside that magic circle um, what's really good I mean if you really want to see because you're asking is it necessary if you join a coven um, especially Wiccan covens I, I mean even if you're on the, if you're beginning out um, in magic, if you're beginning in magic, don't um, hate on the idea of actually looking into joining up with a, a local coven or um, a group of like-minded people that you can start doing rituals with. And then uh, look at really, because Wicca is basically, there's so much free knowledge out there with their rituals now. Understand why they create that circle, that protection circle and also that energetic circle. When you put the cauldron in the middle, for example, in, the, in a specific Wiccan ritual, and your uh, people hold hands, right, so you're charging the room, you're creating this energy, and then you dance around that cauldron of fire, you can actually see the energy begin to form within the circle. And what has happened, for example, in Sydney, um, I joined in with one of the uh, coven rituals there of, uh, actually it wasn't a coven, it was, uh, forgive me if you're watching this, I forget, I just forget your name just right this very second. But uh, there was a, a, a wonderful example of how the, the fire, the elements is affected by the witch's dance. The cone of power not only grew, but started to spin around and shot up and down as the intensity grew. So why I'm sharing this with you, especially if you're a solitaire practitioner, is that you may not feel 
or see that energy when you're by yourself. It is very hard to create that type of atmosphere when you're by yourself. But believe me, that energy is there and that's what you're trying to create in that space. But Joanne, I'll go back to saying, is it necessary? It depends on the ritual that you're trying to do. Now, if I'm just doing um, a demonic spell or um, even a general witchcraft spell, no, I'm not going to um, cast a circle. That's not necessary. But I have a special space that's consecrated that I'll do these rituals in that's already consecrated. So just think about why you're doing it and what type of ritual is. If the ritual calls for it, like if some... Uh, author or some somebody who knows what they're talking about has said cast the circle then cast the circle um, follow exactly what they say say to do um, and, and try and man, uh, manifest a result and then if you do manifest that result feel free to chop and change it naturally um, but do follow their ritual to a T if you're hoping to replicate what they're saying that you can do okay so the next question is by Pedro. I'll just surmise what you're saying, uh, Pedro, here. So basically, Pedro is saying, I'm going to tell my story. And my question is, do you think that I am just imagining things? He says, I always heard a voice in my head speaking with me, giving me advice, telling me what was about to happen. And in a moment, the voice even taught me how to do some spells. The voice always presented himself as Astaroth. But in the first time, I don't even know about the demon. He told me many moments before my father was going to die in an accident and a lot of other spell works that we did together and ended up in success. He has been asking me to do something. Of course, it's a secret. And I feel like he has been working very hard to make this a reality. So, but Pedro's question is, Am I imagining things? And the reason why I, I'm answering this question is because, Pedro, you're not alone in thinking that. Uh, I probably at least have two clients every week in consultation that ask something similar. They either receive a message through dreams or um, they're receiving, depending on what their specific magical skill is, and if you have one, just one magical um, sense activated, I say you are already blessed. That is damn awesome. But um, it, it's people do feel like they're going slightly crazy when they have this ability and they're starting to do things, especially when you're receiving these gifts. I mean, finding out that your father was going to pass beforehand and uh, with Astaroth working alongside you, um, sharing with you secret or arcane knowledge, that's really what it's about. So you're very, very blessed. Now, is it your imagination? Are you going crazy? Well, that's a common question too. People say, am I going nuts? Is it schizophrenia? Or is it, um, you know, depending on your religious beliefs or your background when you're coming into magic, like how do I trust that this this entity is is really telling me the right thing to do? Well, like in Pedro's case, this the uh, and the entity has presented itself as Astaroth. Um, it seems like Astaroth has done nothing but share blessings, share knowledge. So, Pedro, perhaps you're working with Astaroth in one of your past lives, or perhaps Astaroth has really just connected with you. I don't feel like there's any reason to be worried here at all. I feel like your inner voice, you need to trust it, trust your gut, um, because you sound like you're super intuitive. You know that you're not working with um, a, a being that's for your higher purpose, when they're starting to tell you things um, that are not going to benefit your higher purpose. Now, th this means, for example, they, they want you to go and rob a bank. They want you to go and cause harm to somebody, someone that you really, you weren't even thinking about it before, but they're getting you to do all of these stupid things that are, aren't going to be for your higher purpose. So you can benefit to move up 
basically the hierarchy, if you want, of needs and uh, be able to be satisfied with your plot in this life. Um, now, in some circumstances, for, for example, in order to create a path, a better path, maybe you need to lose your job. Maybe you need to go through a period of hardship in order to learn a lesson, a specific lesson. So it triggers our thick human minds into, okay, now I need to go and do this because we become lazy, we're complacent, we don't really like to change even though um, we've been told that the change will give us X, Y, and Z. But um, a spirit that's serving your higher purpose isn't going to get you to do something that's going to land you up, for example, in jail, because that's taking away from your time. And I believe time is our most precious commodity. So no, Pedro, I don't think you're imagining things at all. I don't think you're a schizophrenic. I believe that you're really spiritually blessed and just keep on with it. Build that relationship and... Um, I'm so, I'm really just so happy for you. So the last question is from Sarah and Sarah asks basically, um, is there a heaven and is there a hell? Um, yeah. So that's basically, uh, what she's saying uh, or asking. Now, this is also a super, super common question that we get asked. Remember, this is my perspective. So quite simply, uh, I'll, I'll start by saying there is no simple answer to this. People want a really simplistic answer to that question. Is there heaven? Is there hell? But um, what people are really worrying about is where do we go when we die? Uh, are, we, are we dead? Is there life after death? And um, the simple answer to that, if there has to be a simple answer, is that, of course, um, the body, as we have it right now, there is no more life after it dies. The body dies. We throw it in the dirt. We burn it. We get rid of it. This is, this is our shell. But what we all have is a soul. And so does the soul die? The soul never dies. The soul, <laughs> once once we expire or leave our shell, we do go to another place. Now, everyone has a theory about that, right? <laughs> Depending on the religious system and the religious co uh, code. But um, what we're actually doing is we're really concerned about leaving our loved ones, I suppose, or or being scared about the next place that we go. And so there's no amount of religious debate that you can listen to. There's no answer that I can give you that's going to feel reassuring. My first suggestion, if this is really something that's playing on your mind all the time, and it really does, um, in your late teens and your early 20s, you are uh, quite concerned about this and this issue comes up of course later on in life that becomes a, a common question but I, I recommend that even if it's background noise get on YouTube and find out or research uh, or search for religious debates by some of the top religious scholars so these debates are just like world class. <laughs> yes, I listen probably to a few debates every single week, whether it's uh, rabbis, um, different sheikhs, different um, types of priests and scholars and so forth. They're just really amazing. And what I like about uh, really educated religious people is it's not about bringing the other guys down, but it's explaining their position. And that's where I feel like you can benefit the most. I, I listen to these level of debates all the time. As a Luciferian, for me, it just uh, cements my position and my belief system even more, the more I hear about this, because I feel like I'm saying, you know, if I have to think, why am I following this path? Yes, because I don't like this philosophy. I don't like how they're treating other people. I don't like the context or those religious practices and X, Y, and Z. 
and I'm not listening at it to pull them apart. It's really for my own benefit. So as a Luciferian, you're always on the, the path of spiritual growth or and spiritual understanding. So that's basically what I do. And in saying that, if you really want to hear some educated debate, some of the rabbis have great explanations for the life after death or heaven and hell style debate. Because... Um, depending on which Jewish scholar you're listening to, there is no heaven and there's no hell. And what you're really experiencing in heaven and hell is here on this earth. So what they're saying is to be in heaven means to be closer to God or closer to spirit. So for me right now, I say that I'm living in heaven. I have tailored my um, past 20 years, especially getting rid of the stuff that I don't want, raising children. And now really, in many ways, I've self-actualized. I couldn't imagine living my life any other way or doing anything different right now. I'm, I'm exactly where I want to be. But this wasn't just abracadabra. This was by design and over decades to do exactly this okay something for for you guys to think about especially if you're starting off in the path but I'm I'm I suppose in heaven right now what does hell look like well hell is the opposite to that and so what some would say is not being in in the, under the light of God or under the light of Lucifer you know, to talk in our language and to, to be being away from spirit so there is no, in our code, there is no judgment. Judgment is self-judgment and even your soul. There is no gigantic overarching hater up there that's going to say, you did wrong and now you're going to live in hell. Your body is going to burn in the fires of hell because we don't have a body. Our soul doesn't have a body. We have a shell. So you're never going to burn your body in the fires of hell for eternity. That, that, well, my position is that's BS. And the same is there's no grand place that certain religions, because every religion's people is just going, just them, nobody else. And you're going to have, depending on the religious code, some level of fabulousness, you know, up there that's just exclusive for people who are deemed to do the right thing. That's just not true. When our soul passes over, it's did we achieve what we want to achieve? Because there's only universal love. I hate to sound like a hippie. I feel like they've copied witchcraft. <laughs> but this really what it is, our little soul goes up there and it's like, what did you learn? What do you really want to um, learn again? And then I believe in reincarnation or, you know, if depending on where we are on the path of ascension spiritually as a soul, uh, we can come back down and we can't. I don't know. I don't have all the answers. But I wouldn't focus if there's a heaven and a hell. I truly believe that it was a marketing campaign created about 2,000 years ago in order to control the masses by force and create that fear uh, in people that were illiterate, a lot of people were illiterate at that time and uh, just telling stories to be able to control people, take them away from paganism and force them into something that was just um, unnatural for them at the time through fear. All right, so once again, if you have another thought on that, love to hear it. Throw your links in there or you know, write into us if you want to publish an article on the website. Um, more than happy to get into this level of debate because I think so many of us think about that question in a in a certain time frame or in a certain part of our journey. Well, that's all I have time for this week. Thanks for listening and see you next time.